Hello, everyone. It's great to be back up here with you. I am Aaron Sherinian with the United Nations Foundation, and it's my great honor to be moderating this next panel, which I think you will agree will be one of the most interesting conversations we will see today at Rio Plus Social, and I would say probably one of the more interesting conversations happening in Rio de Janeiro today. It is my great honor to be here with the elders and youngers. And we're gonna have this conversation in two phases. And I am pleased to be with here, as you know, with Gro Harlem Brundtland, the former Prime Minister of Norway, member of the elders, and if she'll allow me to say so, someone that many people call the mother of sustainable development. So it's a great honor to have her here with us today. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. I am also joined by Mary Robinson, the former president of Ireland, member of the elders, and advocate for climate and climate justice and human rights. Thank you for being with us here today. As all of you know, the elders is, and these words are carefully chosen, and I think they're significant. The elders is a group of independent, eminent global leaders working together for peace and human rights around the world. And as people who have seen the conversation around sustainable development in this important organization, it was founded in 2007 by Nelson Mandela, but being people who have seen this conversation, I'd like to pose two questions before we go on to the second portion of our, of our conversation. The first question is for Prime Minister Brundtland. 20 years ago, you were here in Rio de Janeiro. Your dialogue and the words that you used were that these problems related to sustainable development were urgent. That was a description that you used at that time. I'd like to ask you to help us understand, 20 years later, how are you describing the problems today? Well, they certainly are no less urgent. We are throwing, you know, overstepping limits, um, which are the planet reacting to humanity's actions, much more even than what we knew in 92. So the, the, the tragedy is that the world understood. If you look at the declarations from Rio, they have the right messages, they say the right thing about where we need to move. It is, a, it is the drama that we haven't been able as humanity to implement what we understood already 20 years ago. And, and as we're here in Rio, and as you're voicing these concerns, I'd like to ask you, Mary Robinson, what is the voice of the elders? What is the voice in terms of the significance of the voice? And what is the message that that voice is carrying here at the summit? I think the most important thing, perhaps, is who brought us together, Nelson Mandela, and asked us to carry on a vision to make the world more peaceful, to triumph human rights, to reach out to those who feel they are excluded and don't have a voice, to address issues of injustice, discrimination, and what is preventing peace. And um, I think that really is the essence. We have a kind of moral authority. We are completely independent. We talk to those that others don't talk to. We go to places like North Korea. We uh, try to also engage on team issues such as the discrimination against women and girls, and we helped to put together a, a global partnership, Girls Not Brides, to tackle child marriage. We don't have any political power as such, we have moral power, and I think we also have a lot of experience. I certainly have learned a huge amount from my fellow elders, including Gru, and uh, uh, we do our best um, under the chairmanship of Archbishop Tutu, and he's always telling us we can do more. And it's been wonderful to be with these youngers who also challenge us, as I hope we can challenge them. This challenge of sharing experience and doing more is probably the most exciting part about bringing you together here with the people you brought that we're going to meet in a few moments and with everyone in this room and with the world of social media today. Because we're talking about different generations of similar problems living on the same world. So what we're going to see right now is a little bit about what the elders and the youngers have been doing in this project of the last, it's been eight weeks, I understand, the last eight weeks. They've been discussing new ways of thinking about these big world problems. They've been exploring pathways about practical action, not just talking about them. So what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna take a seat. All of you are gonna watch a little bit about the elders and the youngers, and then we're gonna be joined by an intersection of generations and an intersection of ideas up here on the stage. But in the meantime, let's learn about what the elders and the youngers are doing. Let's watch this video.
Rio 20 years ago was extraordinarily important. It gave us Agenda 21, it gave us the Climate Convention, it gave us diversity. There was a sense of being able to build on that leading to the Kyoto Protocol. But that's 20 years ago. What has happened since then? I can't see the implementation and that's what needs to happen. There are universities, centers across the world where young people are studying issues of sustainable development, which was unheard of 20 years ago. It's very important to use this as a good opportunity to mobilize the public, especially the youth. They acknowledge that the rights of young persons are important, they recognize that in the document, and that they also promise to ensure that this right is protected in the future. The most important thing is that countries can agree on certain items that they are willing to report on and willing to move on. A new culture that says you measure whether a country is developed by how its people are. My generation is a global generation. We have the tools to collaborate across borders. I'm part of the Occupy movement in Nigeria. They're trying to make sure we hold our government mm -hmm. accountable to what they do. Give the power to people and let the people drive change. What's your ideas? What's your opinions? Mm -hmm. Let the policy makers know. Because only with the participation of everyone, we're going to get to the, to the changes we want. You analyze what's around you. You see what's right and wrong. You move on it. If necessary, interrupt. Make sure that in any context your voice is heard if you're passionate about what you believe. And I have no doubt at all that you are going to succeed where we failed. We need to change the situation. And that is not just a burden. It's really an opportunity to create something better. So this is where the fun's going to start, because everyone says that they do this. Everyone says that they bring together the leading voices, the leaders on an issue, and the younger generation, but literally the elders and the youngers are the representation of something that's been happening over the last eight weeks. That was exciting to see in the video, but we all together today are going to put this to the test. And this is a test because we're going to talk about it and we're going to see how that interaction takes place. As we were watching the video, some very remarkable people came up on the stage, and we're going we're gonna to introduce them to you right now. I had a chance to meet them, and I've been following them. I've been watching what they do on social media, and these are some people to watch, and we're thrilled to have with us, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mix up the order slightly, with your permission. Um, I'm going to ask for Marvin. Marvin, raise your hand. Marvin is over there, and Marvin is 23. He's an environmental advocate from China who founded the Big Appetite Volunteer Network. It's called the Big Appetite. I love the name. And it's currently under, he's uh, doing an internship right now with UNDP in China and with the, uh, the Carnegie Center for Global Policy, which is really exciting. So Marvin knows his stuff, 23 from China. We have with us Sarah, Sarah Svensson. Raise your hand. Say hi to everybody. Sarah's 27. She is a nonviolent environmental activist and advocate from Sweden. And she's interning with UNEP in Nairobi. And I'm hoping we'll hear a little bit about her experiences in your internship in Nairobi and your experiences uh, being from Sweden. It's great to have a young person here from Sweden. Uh, we are, of course, joined on the stage by Pedro Telles, 23. You probably know Pedro. Pedro's on social media. He's a socio-environmentalist based in a little city called Sao Paulo, Brazil. And he currently works with the Vitae Civilis Institute. So we're great to, we're happy to be in your home country, Pedro. Thank you for having us. And then I would like to have, uh, raise her hand, Esther, Esther Akbarakwe, whom I met recently. And she said, don't call me Esther, call me by my Twitter handle, which I loved. It was great to meet someone who was so active in social media and who was ready to engage and to talk. So the elders and the youngers are here with us. And it's a great chance for us to, to us to see something that's going to happen at the moment because without rehearsal and without any advance notice, unless you changed with, uh, since we've seen each other, without any advance notice, they're going to change the dynamic that usually happens. The elders aren't going to be asked for their advice. 
they're going to ask for the advice of the biggest problems of the youngers. So we're going to have that happen right now, and we're going to start, and uh, uh, Prime Minister Gro Brundtland is going to be with the first question, and she's going to ask uh, questions of two young people, and then we're going to see how that's going to work when Mary Robinson asks some questions. So first of all, let me make sure everyone has their microphones. Does everyone have their mics? Right, some are going to have their mics. I'm going to pass this on to you. And let's get this started. Yeah. So I'm starting with Esther. So Esther, when you came to Oslo with the other, one of the other youngers at, in May and met all of us as elders, what was foremost in your mind to convey to us and to share with us as you now had a chance to share what a young person from Nigeria felt? Well, um, I was actually nervous. <laughs> but I, one burning question I had in my mind and was that, how do you and your team in 19, 20 years ago come to the conclusion to define sustainable development? And your response was so inspiring because you said that we're thinking about the future, and that's why we define sustainable development. And I was so happy and honored to hear you speak, because in the next couple of months, I will be studying sustainable development. So that was my burning, burning um, question. And I was so happy that you thought about our future, and, and you, you come up with that concept of sustainable development. Now I can tell my peers that sustainable development is about the future, it's not about the past. Thank you, Esther. Now, Pedro, here in Brazil, what is on your mind and your young friends' minds, you know, as you approach and think about burning issues from a Brazilian perspective as you approach Rio? Well, I'd say that Brazil is going through a very special moment now. We've been having some strong progress, as many opportunities we have in this country nowadays. But unfortunately, we haven't been able to do it sustainably. We haven't reached sustainable development yet. And this is right out there now at Rio Plus 20. We have many challenges, and I see that my generation simply doesn't like the way things are going too much. We simply feel, and I don't think this is only Brazil, I think this is also Nigeria, China, Sweden, and all other countries. What I see is that young people demand change. Many people are simply frustrated on the way things are going and moving forward and looking for alternatives. That's how I see it today here. All right. I, how do they do? Well, 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 we'll wait till we hear all the questions and then we'll give them a grade. I think that's probably the best thing. Very nice. Mary Robinson, over to you. I am really enjoying this. You know, <laughs> for the last eight weeks, they've been asking us questions, some of them difficult questions. Now it's my turn. Sarah, I'll start with you. <laughs> you've been working in UNEP, so you've gained a lot of inside experience of how the United Nations primarily deals with the environment. If you had all the power in the world, what would you do to make the UN more effective on the environment? The UN started working on environmental issues 40 years ago in Stockholm in Sweden. And I know that my king, who is here today, was there. But I was not there because I was not born yet. <laughs> but since then, the UN has been working on environmental issues. And that's great. And they have created a very complex system with overlap and fragmentation and lack of resources. There are 500 multilateral environmental agreements that focus on different environmental issues. And it's simply not working because at the same time, the environmental situation in the world has declined. So we really need to do something to bring greater coherence to this system. And I think that the environmental pillar needs to be much stronger in the UN system so that it can work together with the social and environmental pillars on the same level and same power to bring sustainable development to the world. And I think it's crucial that young people and civil society are seen as natural allies to the UN to help make this change happen. Thank you, Sarah. I hope those delegates in the Rio Centro are listening to you because I think you are spot on. Marvin, uh, you come from the largest country in the world. And I know you're very connected with a lot of young people in China, a lot of young people around the world. About how many people you know, do you communicate with? And what is your idea of what would be a success of Rio? What would you feel is top of your agenda for the, the Rio conference? Um, 
In China, we have like a very uh, different um, system for social media. We have like a separate uh, uh, version of Twitter and Facebook in China. We have Weibo, Xinhang Weibo, and uh, Ren Ren Wang. And there, I have like about uh, uh, overall 8,000 followers there. And also, I'm managing my organization's uh, accounts, so uh, maybe like um, 10,000 overall. Um, and for me, as I like, uh, from China, a country with um, 80 million uh, communist um, party members, I think the most top of my agenda will be equity. Equity is a very fascinating idea of uh, the whole history, maybe. So I would like to see our world be more fair and more equitable. Here, I see that at Rio Central, somehow we are have uh, kindly secured the CBDR, which is the Common but Differentiated Responsibilities resp uh, Principle. But I also want to see more um, fair and uh, uh, equitable gender, um, regional equity, and lots of this kind of concept to be inserted to the final text. And I think uh, regarding to the social media, I think it's quite important for us to use this tool to start the dialogue and listen to each other, listen to each other's opinion and ideas. It will be the first step to get the consensus at our society on web, online, offline, and also here at the Rio Sancho at the international negotiations. So how do we think they did? I don't know if the elders were asking me a question unrehearsed in front of hundreds of thousands of people. I would be pretty nervous. How do you think they did? <laughs> Come on, let's give them a hand. I think that was pretty good. Now, I haven't asked the elders yet, and we'll find out, I think, later on as we continue this debate and the conversation. So social media is going crazy with questions for this group, because this is not a typical living room to have this many different people from this many different countries representing so many different perspectives. And so let's get into some of the questions that we're hearing, specifically blending a couple of questions right now from Twitter. Are you ready? Because we're going to get this conversation going with this group. I love this question right now that's, uh, uh, that's, that's, that's come in. And this is from at San Reinmore. And uh, uh, he says, I'm a young person. How is it that I inspire the older generation to take sustainability seriously? And this is something that we've seen come in. This is a one question that represents many questions. Young people who are interested in sustainable development, how do you get the older generation to take it seriously? They're not saying governments, they're saying the older generation. So I think this is an interesting question for all of you. And what I'd like to do is we're gonna go in a bit of a, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna leapfrog a little bit if we can. So I'm actually gonna start from here and we're gonna go in this direction and we'll change the order up a little bit. So yeah, tell what would you do as a young person to inspire the older generation to take sustainability seriously? Uh, for my gener uh, following my experiences at China, I would say two points very basically. First is get the older generation online. Hmm. Get them use um, Sina Weibo and Twitter and Facebook maybe. Yes. It's first very important so they can access to the information. The second thing that we need to like, provide the visible things, the truth happening at uh, grassroots, happening at uh, our social society, to let them know, make it visible and very vivid to the older generation. Then they can be aware of this problem. Then they will start to take actions. I have learned a lot of sustainable uh, practices from my grandmother, actually, because when she was young, people in Sweden took care about their belongings much more and repaired clothes that were broken and uh, things like that. So I, I learned to do that from her. But she was not doing it because she cared about sustainable development, but because that was what everybody did at that time. And now, when I learn the skills from her how to repair my things, then I talk to her about environmental issues, and she understands why I do it. And I think that young people have a lot of energy and passion to drive change, and we need to share this with the older generation to inspire them to also create change. I think because um, we're in such a transformative time, it's, it's, a, it's a time when so much is changing and the problems are very acute, including the climate change issue, mm -hmm that we need the voices of young people to be actually at the tables. Um, some attempt has been made, and I'm, you know, I honor that, by Brazil in the sustainability panels, etc. But even so, they're not there at the real tables, and the age group at the real tables is, is not so young. <laughs> um, that said, I must say, I do think that in a, an interesting way, women tend to be very intergenerational, because you know, we have a more 
nurturing uh, tendency. I know when my first grandchild was born, I had a kind of physical reaction to that. I, that's all I can say. Mm -hmm. And I do have a perspective of about 100 years because my four grandchildren, I now have four, will be in their 40s in 2050 and they will share the world with at least nine billion others. And I just care about that deeply because it's, it's relevant to me. Maybe if we made the older generation see more that they have to nurture the future and the earth for the future. And the, you know, um, that's the sustainable development. That's what Gru was telling us 25 years ago. Can, can you repeat for us again your four grandchildren? Give us that statistic again. Uh, they'll be in their 40s in 2050, okay. and they will share the world with at least 9 billion others. Nine, That's what we're being told. And, you know, that really, and I care about all those, you know, not just my, narrowly my grandchildren, obviously. Um, it's just, it, it does give you that perspective. Whereas most politicians are thinking six months or the next election, you know, the horizon is far too short. And young people have a different horizon. They have, it's their future. Right. And they should be more in the decision making. Thank you. I could hear in the room, in everyone's head, people doing similar math. I started doing the math about my kids, and so I wanted to make sure that everyone had a chance to, to redo that mathematics as we're talking about development. Pedro, what do you think? Well, I think that many times people from older generations and even from our generation see sustainable development as restriction. Hmm. What, we, what, we gotta, what we gotta show is that actually that's the way out of the crisis we have, and actually living sustainably is, is better for all of us. If we can send this message to everyone, if we can phrase sustainable development as not a luxury or not something that's a problem, but actually as, as the way out of our crisis, then I guess more people will be on the boat with us. You know, the, the person who asked this question uh, on Twitter, I mean, I was thinking, how can you inspire older people like me? Well, you know, in my mind, young people are the ones who are going to take over the management of our lives and our, their lives and our grandchildren's lives. So it is so important when you realize that young people are thinking beyond their individual situation, their individual resources and thinking more broadly on, an, on society and in the wider world. To me, any young people who thinks beyond him or herself and thinks about the future and are kind of getting ready to take charge. That's what inspires me. The management, that management will be in their hands. Great, what do you think? Uh, for me, it's um, like what Sarah said. My mother really believed that um, if I could go to school as a young girl, I would grow up to be more, live in the most sustainable world. I will have the right to define my future. The right to define my future. The right to define some of my future. The right to define my some of my future. The right to define 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 some of my future. coming up. And the theme is that these people represent not only different generations, but different geographies. And you're going to be going home at some point, right? You travel around the world, you're here in Rio, but at some point you will go home. Will you yes. go home? Okay. And the question is, when you're going home after the Rio meeting, what are you going home with as your greatest worry? And what are you going home with as your greatest hope? Good question, people. I think that social media is really taking this seriously. And so I'm, I'm gonna start, and I'm gonna ask Mary Robinson to start the, with this. And we're gonna go to have this question to the three of you, if we can. Are you ready for this? So we'll pass the mic around. We're gonna ask Mary Robinson to ask that question. As you go home, what are you bringing back from Rio as your greatest worry and as your greatest hope after this dialogue has happened? 
I think my greatest worry would be because I listened this morning to a room full of women from different parts of the world during the UN Women's, Women's Forum and the frustration I heard about the fact that, for example, um, sexual reproductive rights are not in the agenda, that there is a sense that there are not the institutions, you, you know, there isn't an agency of the environment, that the, the, that the text, given the, the, the sort of problems we are facing and the very critical moment that um, we may not come away from uh, Rio with as much as we wish. Mm -hmm. the hope is actually also drawing on exactly that roomful and the young people that we've been meeting. There is a sense in civil society here, global civil society and Brazilian civil society, we have to concert more and work more together and we have to take a few issues and really make a difference. And I think over the next few years, we're going to see a mobilization globally by civil society that's really going to make a difference. That's my real hope. And nice. I think I saw it here in Rio. Very nice. Very nice. Thank you. What do you think? As you're going home, as you're going to return to Sweden, what are you bringing home with as your hope and as your worry? My greatest hope and my greatest, po um, my greatest worry is people. Because I think that people... If people are inspired and think that they are empowered to create change, then positive change will happen. But if people are disempowered and think that change is not possible, then it will not happen. So I really think that it's key to, to make people take action and to translate the outcomes of Rio Plus 20 into positive action for the future by people, everybody. Um, my worry will be that uh, a lack of awareness yeah. that the world leaders, business people, mm. social leaders like you guys, have not aware that we are right now needing our systematic change, a revolution, a systematic uh, overall picture um, change right now at this moment. Here we are at Rio Central at these international negotiations. We are fighting on languages, we are fighting on words. It doesn't matter about the revolution at all. Mm. I'm quite concerned about that. People are not aware of this, actually. The other worry for me is that the differentiation between your action and your minds. Sometimes we feel that the, uh, the, the temperature in Rio Central is ridiculously low. Everyone is quite cold, feel cold so much. It's like the high, high emission, right? Hard carbon. I think like, this kind of thing should not, never happen when we get back to our country, especially when we start from ourselves. Hmm. Inter important challenge, thank you. Important challenge from our, uh, from our, for our friend from China. I'm gonna, I need to make sure I give Esther time to answer the next question because it's gonna come to you, to this th the, the, the three in this very intergenerational global living room that we've created here. Uh, the question is, what has most surprised you, surprised you during the last eight weeks about the other generation that you've been meeting with. So we're putting Esther on the spot to find out what surprised her about the elders. And Prime Minister Brunton is going to tell us what surprised her about the younger. So you three are going to ask, answer this question from social media. Um, well, <laughs> I mean, they're just two fantastic group of people. Um, <laughs> what surprised me instead, beyond that they are institution of knowledge and inspiration, they are also human beings, they are mothers. So they can feel how we feel. And um, and I think too, what surprises me too is that they are very welcoming to our ideas. Usually, you know, in my culture, they said the elders are the wisdom. You know, they only have the, they are the monopoly of knowledge. But here, the elders here are actually welcome to our ideas, listen to us, and engage us. And um, yeah, it's quite interesting. So you are the one. <laughs> Hello. So the Prime Minister wants to, wants to see what the answer is, right? We're going to see. That's a smart, smart strategy. I would say there were two surprises. One surprise is the power of dialogue. And that's something, well, that, that's something that has always amazed me. But with this group, having the chance of, of discussing with, with the elders and the other youngers, it has been simply amazing. And we surely need more of these inside the UN, inside our governments, inside our society, everywhere, the power of dialogue. And the second thing that surprised me is that I hoped to, to receive some magic advices, but the thing is, there's no magic. <laughs> what we learned uh, discussing with them and the, the huge experience that, that they have is that we, we have to get our hands to work. Uh, it's hard work, and that's it. There, there's no magic tip, tip. There's no, well, we gotta go for it. 
everybody together. Great, thank you. So, um, a wise young man, as you heard, that uh, he realizes that none of us, you know, are more than human, uh, and none of us have every answer. Uh, but the thing is that these young people, I, I wouldn't say it surprised me, because they were picked to be people that we could trust to have something to bring to the table. So we were, I was just impressed by uh, the good choice that we made uh, and the wonderful uh, way of communication that all of you have shown uh, and the fun we have had together in exchanging views. And as you said, Pedro, we are so dependent on one another in this world, young and old, across the world from different geographic areas. And this comes very strongly forward when you have four young people from very different parts of the world. I think that, that what we've been given here is, we've been given a, a, a real gift, a gift of some insights. We heard a couple of themes. The themes coming from our, our friend from China, that, that issue of challenging the next generation to utilize social media, a challenge to the younger generation because they will be managing the sustainable, the sustainable development issues that we're talking about today. There was the challenge about making sure that awareness is at the heart of what we're doing, because that broadens what, what's happening. And then we heard about the challenge of, of some of the problems that hit home, because they're a part of a woman's life, a man's life, regardless of, of, of where they're living. And that the sustainability, as we heard, especially from our colleague here from Africa, is something that, that is part of all of our lives, regardless of where we live. Uh, I would like to thank the, the elders and the youngers for challenging each of us to think intergenerationally to think socially and to think about a dialogue instead of just thinking about talking, but using the two ears that we've been given uh, doubly as much as the one mouth that we've been given as we're learning and growing and driving the sustainability conversation. Help me in thanking this dynamic group of people. Thank you.